All right, so in the last section we talked about local potentials and action potentials and how we started talking about how an action potential is propagated down this cell. So um, this is just as a review. Um, so here's our nerve cell. It's uh, more positive on the outside, more negative on the inside. Um, a depolarizing current passively spreads down the axon, causing the interior of the axon to become more positive than when the membrane is resting. So we go from that minus 70 millivolts to minus 55 millivolts. And in the adjacent membrane, when the depolarizing current release, release, uh, reaches threshold levels, sodium channels open, those voltage-gated sodium channels, causing rapid depolarization of that section of the membrane. Um, the action potential is generated and the depolarizing current continues to propagate down the axon. So each section opens more and more sodium channels as it goes down. And you know those sodium channels, they open and then they close. And then the next set opens and closes. And the next set opens and closes. And that propagates the action potential down the axon. So how can we make that faster? Sometimes we got to have it fast, right? We, that cerebellum needs information to keep us balanced and keep us coordinated. So one way to make propagation faster is to have more myelination on the axons. And we'll talk about this in the somatosensory chapter and some of the other chapters. <clears throat> we talk about myelinated and unmyelinated axons, and really uh, most of them are myelinated but it's the degree of myelination. Some of them are more myelinated than others, if that makes any sense. So, <clears throat> the um, myelin, it's a sheath of proteins and fats that surround an axon, and they act as an insulator. They prevent current flow across the axonal membrane. So um, myelination increases the speed of action potential propagation and the distance a current can passively spread. The thicker myelin leads to faster conduction and greater chances for action potential propagation. So <clears throat> the myelin, as we, uh, we'll talk about the glial cells um, in a minute, or a couple minutes, um, but the myelin is created by those Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system and oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. Um, so we end up with s small patches of myelinated axons which lack myelin. And so these um, little patches of unmyelinated um, axon are specialized for active propagation of an action potential by allowing the ion flow across the membrane. So every one to two millimeter along the axon, there are high densities of sodium and potassium channels in those little nodes. And they're called the nodes of Ranvier. Um, back in the time when people were naming things after themselves, some neurologist named Ranvier named, named those. So one to two millimeters, that sounds significant, doesn't it? Because we know that a local potential spreads about one to two millimeters. So um, the as the action potential spreads rapidly along a myelinated region, it slows down when it crosses a node of Ranvier. So you end up with this quick node-to-node -node jumping of the action potential down a myelinated axon, which is called saltatory conduction. <clears throat> so by jumping, that um, the action potential appears to jump from node to node, um, the depolarizing potential spreads rapidly along myelinated regions of the axon and then slows when it crosses the unmyelinated node of Ranvier. When an action potential is generated at a node of Ranvier, the depolarizing potential again spreads quickly across the myelinated regions and then jumps to the next node. So um, <clears throat> that speeds up conduction. Also, a larger... Um, neuron is going to have faster conduction. So larger and more myelinated equals faster conduction. So it's the, the fire hose versus the garden hose. So there are, we talked about this a little bit um, a couple of lectures ago. There are three functional groups of neurons based on the direction of information flow. Afferent neurons carry sensory information from the periphery towards the central nervous system. 
Afferent neurons relay commands from the central nervous system to smooth and striated muscles and to glands. And interneurons act throughout the nervous system, processing information locally or conveying information short distances. They are the largest class of neurons. So we have, um, you know, a fair number of afferents and efferents, but interneurons are carrying all that information. So um, really, the the whole point of the nervous system is the interaction between neurons. That's those. Um, neural pathways is what creates all of the um, action in our body, basically. Um, so <clears throat> neurons can um, interact in different ways, and two of the ways that they interact are called um, divergence and convergence, and they contribute to the distribution of the information throughout the nervous system. So um, a pathway doesn't, even though we show it simply as as being um, one neuron communicates with one neuron communicates with one neuron, um, it's actually way more complex than that. So, of course, the information in the neuron is propagated only in one direction, um, but because of the way they um, connect, um, they can, it can go in a lot of different ways. So. <clears throat> Convergence is when you get multiple inputs from a variety of cells terminating on a single neuron. Um, and divergence is a single neuron with many branches that terminate on uh, multiple cells. So you could get either one, um, and that's going to change the way the information um, propagates and is distributed throughout the nervous system. So um, the really the process of um, convergence and divergence, um, a single stim stimulus can produce a substantial response. So um, an example of convergence is the neural input to sensory association areas in the cerebral cortex, where information from hearing, vision, and touch is all integrated. Um, so all of that information is coming into um, a single neuron or group of neurons, and it's being integrated to figure out what are we what are we hearing, seeing, and touching, <laughs> you know, and making a whole picture out of it. Um, an example of divergence is the signaling of information from a pin prick. So you prick your finger with a pin and it activates end receptors of sensory neuron that transmits information about tissue damage. The message is conveyed to multiple neurons in the spinal cord, eliciting a motor response that moves the body part away from the stimulus. Um, other neurons relay information to the brain that leads to conscious awareness of the pain. So, um, the, with the convergence and divergence, um, they contribute to how the information is distributed and used throughout the nervous system. So, um, that's kind of cool, right? So, we have, besides the neurons, we have these other um, lovely cells in the nervous system, which are signaling and supporting cells. Um, glial cells, they form a critical support network for the neurons, and they also transmit information. So, the word glia is derived from the Greek word for glue. So, probably the person that originally called them this thought that it just glued the nervous system together, but now we know that they do have... Um, a lot of functional significance in the nervous system. So the glial cells are categorized by, si uh, categorized by size and function. Um, macroglia are large ones and microglia are small ones. Um, there are three types, three categories really of glia. Myelinating, signaling, cleaning and nourishing, and defending. So all those things sound pretty important, right? <laughs> so let's talk about them. The myelinating um, glia are the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells. So oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system. Each one myelinates parts of several axons from different neurons. So they're these little, um, little cells that are wrapping around a lot of different axons and insulating the centr central nervous system. Um, when we have problems with the oligodendrocytes, it results in demyelination and the, for the formation of plaques, and that is what's called multiple sclerosis. 
So multiple sclerosis is dysfunction of the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. And because they're uh, myelinating parts of several different axons, you can have several different um, effects. You can have lots of different symptoms, and it's going to vary from person to person because it depends on which axons are affected. Schwann cells are the myelinating cells in the peripheral nervous system, and they may wrap around one axon or several axons like the um, oligodendrocytes. So <coughs> it is really, the, the um, Schwann cells are really the only supporting cells of the peripheral nervous system. Um, all of the other glia are mostly in the central nervous system. Um, but they, um, aside from the insulating properties of the myelin, they also provide trophic factors for the repair of axons. So one of the huge factors, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, in um, repairing um, axons in the peripheral nervous system, repairing from damage or injury, is um, are the myelin sheaths intact? Um, is there other chemical factors that are attracting the right cells to um, heal those areas? So Schwann cells play a really big um, role in um, repair and healing from nerve damage. So they're pretty important cells. And so we have um, peripheral demyelinating diseases such as Guillain-Barre syndrome that we'll talk about in a little bit um, that affect the Schwann cells. But um, for lots of different reasons which we will discuss um, in a few chapters, um, there's a much greater ability to um, heal in the peripheral nervous system than there is in the central nervous system. So um, the signaling, cleaning, and nourishing um, functions of the glial cells are done by the astrocytes. So astrocytes are star-shaped macroglial cells that are found throughout the central nervous system. Um, they can be stimulated by signals from adjacent neurons or by mechanical changes. So stimulated astrocytes spread waves of calcium ions to um, neighboring astrocytes through gap junctions. And um, on the next slide, there's a little picture of how those guys are communicating, which is kind of cool. Um, so neurons aren't the only communicating cells in the nervous system. Astrocytes also communicate with each other. Um, so they signal each other as to things that are going on in the nervous system. Um, they also act as scavengers, taking up extra potassium ions in the extracellular environment. We know that there's normally more potassium inside the cell than outside the cell. Um, and so the astrocytes are kind of like, oh, there's too much potassium in this area, let's clean it up. Um, they also remove chemical transmitters um, from the synaptic cleft between neurons and clean up other debris in the extracellular space. So part of the function at the synapse, and we'll talk about this in the next chapter, um, the uh, neurotransmitters get released in the synapse and then they have to be um, removed from the synapse so you can sort of refresh it and get ready for the next wave of neurotransmitters. So the astrocytes um, act as scavengers um, helping to clean up, which is pretty nice to have those guys. They're also, um, in this picture, the, um, the astrocytes are a big part of the blood-brain barrier. So um, they are forming a linkage, a linkage between neurons and capillaries to provide nutrition from those capillaries and to filter out anything that might be coming in that could negatively affect those neurons. So astrocytes are hugely important. Um, microglial cells normally function as um, phagocytes. So there are nervous system phagocytes cleaning up the neural environment and they're continually sampling the extracellular environment for indicators of damage. And they clean up debris from dying cells. In um, chapter four, we'll talk a little bit about some of the cascade of cell death that happens um, when there is assault and damage to the nervous system and these guys are part of the defense, which is pretty cool. So just, um, you know, not in the way of uh, anything that needs to be tested or <laughs> anything like that, but um, just because it's interesting, um, there's some interesting information about glial cells. So an increased concentration of um, glial cells might boost our ability to think. Um, after Albert Einstein died, his brain was removed from his body within seven hours of his death, and it's been extensively studied. 
And um, one of the things they found was that um, Einstein's brain had an increased number of glial cells in the areas of higher thought. So, um, wow, isn't that cool? So the glial cells are obviously doing a lot for us, even though we don't know the full extent of what they're doing. The average human cerebral cortex has a 2 to 1 glial index. In other words, each neuron has at least two glial cells um, serving it. And um, their rodents, um, there's a little comparison. I have this in the outline, even though I don't have it in the PowerPoint. Um, rodents have 0.4 glial cells per neuron. Worms have 0.7. And dolphins have three glial cells per neuron. So um, I guess dolphins have it going on in the uh, central nervous system area, which is, you know, interesting. Uh, take it for what you want. Just an interesting little fun fact. So um, we're, I'm going to wrap up this section, and then we're going to start talking about neuroinflammation. And that has to do with glial cells, but um, it has more to do with pathology.